Um, I don't think that public space is enough. And I certainly don't think that public space would make up for uh, generational kind of discrimination and inequality. I do think that public space is a resource for people who don't have other resources and public space is very malleable. And as the previous presenter said, can serve communities anything from growing food to providing spaces for childcare to providing spaces where you could wash clothes. Uh, so public space is helpful, but it certainly would never address kind of systemic inequality. So um, I think that's what's been very interesting in South Africa um, is there's a there's been there's been projects uh, implemented in townships uh, and the concept is called reblocking, and essentially what the city of Cape Town has done is gone to township areas to work with communities to see how layouts can of of kind of informal housing can be uh, rejigged in a way to assist the city in providing services uh, in places that aren't actually where land tenure is not possible. Um, so I think there's a, like a middle ground there. But, you know, what worries me is that is that when in a situation like that, when a, where, where the government is trying to assist in a space of, of just desperate poverty, that it, it entrenches poverty in a sense to say, well, you know, we've really helped you out, haven't we? And it sort of it doesn't really help people to get to get out of the poverty trap. So I think I think public space is very very important, um, but I wouldn't want a public space discussion to divert from things like people being able to um, access the ability to buy land, uh, the kinds of uh, financial resources, um, like just even access to banking. Um, uh, I think for refugees, we've got a huge refugee community in Cape Town. I think for people to have the kind of of, of kind of paperwork that supports them being active uh, citizens economically, um, I think it's a lot more there than public space. But I do think that public space that is well managed and managed by communities helps to lift some of the load um, mm-hmm. that communities who are surviving have to um, manage. So, so yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think active public space is, is, is a really great place to start discussing those more systemic issues um, that can help uh, communities out of uh, poverty traps. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And would you agree, Ms. Lai, would you say, well, as a third, okay, because I, I thought when I understood you, okay, we will not reach as much um, by choosing the formal uh, approach, um, it's better to choose the informal approach. Would you say we need more holistic strategies? Well, you know, I find it is very important what Kirsten has just said, that you uh, shouldn't um, think too far and think that the public space is the panacea um, or the silver bullet to solve all uh, problems. Those re-blocking uh, projects, I know them. And, but what is interesting, it's not an invention of the Cape Town community, but it was civil society organizations that initiated them because they wanted to, to point it out that they want to continue to live somewhere. And Kirsten also mentioned the access to land. And this is essential. And they are great examples. Kailicha is one of the townships in Cape Town. Um, there you try to uh, give people the right to continue to live somewhere without them having papers uh, about owning the land. So uh, the uh, city of Cape Town administration simply writes a letter to them and says, okay, you live here, we recognize that, and by means of this paper, you get access to bank account, etc. And in a second um, step, this must not lead to a beneficiary list of who is entitled to own a house. And it's not about, in my point of view, um, keeping people in the poverty trap. I think um, more of an area-based approach, meaning that you do not focus on the individual, but rather think about um, the community infrastructures that you can invest in and which benefit to everybody, like a library, for instance. And I think 
in this regard, the public space can actually do a lot. Uh, what about you, Mr. Lucke? What's your idea of the contribution the public space can make in order to mitigate social inequalities? That's a very important contribution, um, but I, I, I have to say that we do not have these huge mega cities uh, in, in Germany, you know, like uh, streets like in Cape Town, we don't have them in Germany. And uh, our experience is that the uh, interspace, so to speak, uh, the, the half public spaces are often used by our neighborhoods and um, neighborhood um, and when I'm speaking of neighborhood I'm not only speaking about districts but about real neighbors and people like to use uh, for instance um, a pergola or a you know, it's not really a private, but it's neither a public space. It's in between the two of them. And we have a really strong feeling in uh, of, of being neighbors in some areas in my town, thanks to these um, semi-public spaces. Yes, I agree with you, Mr. Lucky. We have to get away from this idea or this perception of the public place from a merely um, administrative perspective because um, you know it doesn't really matter whether a place or a space belongs to the public or to the private sector what is important is that it can be used by everybody and uh, Kirsten, there's a very interesting study, a Cape Town study. Uh, Sophie Oldfield is the author. She uh, looked at um, uh, getting together of a black and white population that used to not share a lot during their daily lives. They went to different schools, some went to the mosque, some to church, etc. But when they got together, their children started playing together in the public space. And this is something that can create bonds between neighbors. Kirsten just said that structural problems can, of course, not be uh, solved by simply opening up public spaces, etc. The question you have to ask is why are getting our cities more and more fragmented? Of course, we cannot comp compare ourselves to Kapstadt the Cape Town, sorry, but uh, even in Stuttgart, you know, if you have not a lot of money, you can't afford to live in the inner city anymore nowadays. So which instruments could be, um, uh, could could uh, actually be implemented in order to avoid real estate um, prices explosion? And the public space is, of course, not... Uh, the factor that is going to change this trend. But nevertheless, I do think that we still have public spaces that are being used by all parts of society. And I think it's completely different in Cape Town. I always realize when I get back from Cape Town to Europe that the differences are so huge there. And I think in Germany, actually, the challenge is to maintain what you have already achieved. Um, could you give us an example, you know, uh, because when you say you, you come back from South Africa, what is so striking about the differences you mentioned? Why do you say it's, it's quite different in Germany? Well, it's a lot about safety. Sorry to say that, Kirsten. But of course, in South Africa, you always look uh, behind you when you move through public space because you're afraid of an assault. And this is really um, a, a part of moving in public space. In the inner city of a Cape Town, there's CCTV everywhere, video surveillance. So this topic of safety it's not such, a, such an issue in Germany, you know, in Stuttgart, I don't worry when I take a walk through the city at night. Uh, 
I, I don't have this fear of um, meeting another human being. Well, this might lead us back to one idea from the Ideas Workshop where this app was mentioned, the safety pin app, which shows um, the safe neighborhoods. Yeah, I think in, in, in Cairo, they are using that because there are a lot of assaults on women and there is a, an app like this in order to help women feel safe in public space. Okay, um, there's another question directed to Kirsten in the chat. Um, have there been any incidents, like for example, gangs on the streets who tried to sabotage the event or violent confrontations because opposite groups met each other? Did yeah, that's, a, that's a great question. question. Thanks, Thanks for that. And I think the safety conversation is really important generally. Um, because I often find that, you know, uh, safety is, is especially in like a public space environment and that the, just back to the ghetto question, it's like, if the city doesn't care enough, who will the space belong to next? And so I think that, that the people, the groups, uh, syndicates, gangs that step into that place of ownership, um, when a place is either neglected or not well taken care of, I think that becomes a very complex issue. Um, and I think I want to I want to highlight the the um, example of Medellin and Colombia, which I had the chance to visit, which was amazing. And you know, people say, "Well, how did Colombia turn around? Like, how did Medellin go from being this like run by gangs and drugs and syndicates and being the murder capital of the world to being somewhere so amazing?" And it truly is. It's incredible. And and one of the city officials said to me, "It was very simple. What the city did." is they did their job better than the job that the gangs were doing. So gangs who wanted money, if you want to walk down the street safely, you pay a little bit of money. The city needed to be the best it could be at taking care of everything in the poorest neighborhoods so that they retained the, the ownership of the space. And I think when it comes to safety, I think that, that, that when, when communities are disenfranchised from, from, from being politically engaged, they tend not to be able to have that ownership of space. And so, so poverty for me is not necessarily related to crime directly. In places of poverty, people are disenfranchised from being able to be engaged in making spaces their own, either through a lack of resources or not being able to have, and, and resources being time. When you're surviving, you don't have time to go to community meetings. When people can own their space, then I think safety is a different conversation either because people are still surviving and there's going to be opp opportunistic crime in places that are kind of poverty um, traps, as I've said. But I think, I, think, I think political activity and being able to engage is really, really important. And Medellin is a great example of how that turned around. But it's turned around by the city, not, not turned around by the community, putting its hand up. The city said, we're going to be, we're going to out awesome gangs. So I wanted to touch on that because I think it's very important because the answer to the question around have we had open streets incidents is no. We've had 23, 22 open streets days and we haven't had a single incident on any one of our streets, not one. I think we've maybe handed out like two or three plasters or band-aids for, for kids who've fallen off their bikes. That's literally what's happened and the reason is because we've spent 90 percent of our time engaging with people uh in the community because it's their open streets day mm. like all i do at the end of the day is put barriers up to stop cars mm. everything else belongs to to people and i think that's really really the, like the secret source mm.